morning, everybody. Thanks for coming out. I'm Ron Stratton. I'm the current chairman of the POA Board of Directors. Uh, so uh, the board formed what we call the Valley Task Force. I want to introduce to you the members of the Valley Task Force and talk about what they have done. It's headed by Jim Abramson right here. Many of you know Jim. Jim has uh, been here a long time. He worked for Cooper, Cooper Communities. He laid out uh, our golf courses and most of the community. He knows more about that, has more background of this than, than anybody in our village. Um, and a board member. Another board member, David Welchel. David was kind enough to volunteer for the board in a uh, seat that had become vacant. David is a golf course architect. He has uh, designed and remodeled golf courses and golf course communities all over the world. Um, he uh, is still working and yet he's puts all of this volunteer time in, in addition to working on the Valley Task Force. Uh, a lot of the improvements you've seen through our golf courses, the, uh, the, the bunkers, the collars, uh, and these improvements he's consulted on for not a dime of compensation and put in hundreds of hours of work for us. Uh, Tom Judson, you know, uh, is our general manager, and all of you know uh, what a great um, uh, addition he's been, a great manager over the two and a half years that he's been here. Mike Taggart is uh, our Director of Maintenance, Construction, and Water Utility. Been here a long time. Nobody knows more about water than Mike does. Um, and then uh, Keith Eames, who is uh, our Director of Golf Course Maintenance. Many of you may not know when we got Keith, he had been President of the uh, American Society of uh, Golf Course Maintenance. I don't know how you say that, but... Uh, a lot, of, a lot of words in it, but, but one of the top people in the country, and as you know, we're very fortunate to have him. What these people have done is we've, we're through this, um, first of all, I'm not a member of the committee, um, but what I've tried to do is talk to as many people as possible, get as many ideas as possible, provide as much support as I possibly could, and at the same time, stay out of the way and, and let them do their job. Through this, we've consulted with the following people. The Army Corps of Engineers was uh, kind enough to send pe three people here uh, from Little Rock. Um, our Valley Task Force, after considering a number of companies, uh, settled on Burns and McDonnell Engineering. Uh, they are a well-known, well-respected firm nationwide and particularly knowledgeable of this area. And we're fortunate to have Ryan Castor here um, from Burns and McDonald, and uh, he has been the lead person on uh, all of this work that's been done that you're going to see today. We've talked with two landscape firms, landscape architecture firms from around the country. We have talked with uh, members of uh, the Cooper communities, representatives there, representatives of the cities of Bella Vista and Bentonville, and representatives of the Walton Family Foundation. As you know, they're very involved with the Razorback Greenway, with our trails, uh, discussing how that will continue and uh, involved too with uh, Lake Bella Vista and how that uh, uh, might be best resolved. Through all of this, we've spent about $90,000. We've shared some expenses uh, with some entities and we've taken some ourselves and put in hundreds of hours of work, much of it volunteer. As you look at the data today that Tom's going to present, I want you to just keep one thing in mind. A lot of our watershed is Bentonville and Centerton. The population of Bentonville and Centerton, when these golf courses in the valley were built, was 7,000 people. The population of those communities now is 87,000 people. It's that many more areas that used to be pasture and oak forest that's now driveways and rooftops and parking lots and streets, uh, et cetera. And ask yourself, with this growth, what's it going to be in five years, 10 years, 20 years? We do now know that um, these events we've had over the last eight years were not 100-year floods. And in fact, our valley will continue to flood with even relatively common, relatively frequent rain events. With an actual 100-year flood, what we've seen so far is quite, quite minor by comparison. Now, we've been exploring all the possible ways for mitigating flood damage in the valley. We've heard a lot of suggestions from you and we've uh, addressed all of those, and Tom's going to cover all of those today. Our process is that we are going to gather facts, which was what we've been doing, then communicate those facts to our property owners, which is what we are doing now and will be doing for some time, then consider all the options, and then propose solutions. And through that, we'll be gathering 
input and uh, advice from you. What we're not prepared to discuss today is any decisions or any proposed actions because we simply don't know yet. We haven't had the, all of this information much longer than you've seen it. Now, we're already hard at work. We're considering all kinds of options. We're, we're debating, we're discussing, and trying to dis determine what those, we've heard a lot of suggestions from you, and we are considering all of those suggestions. We have committed to having another meeting on April 10th. And what we will do on that is at least try to lay out some basic options within certain categories, the pros and cons of those, and seek further input from you as our property owners. There will be no final resolution to all of this challenge anytime soon. There is no quick, easy answer that we're going to make a decision, regardless of what you may see and hear and, and people running around with their hair on fire. So how can you help with our, with our analysis? We want to hear all constructive ideas, all constructive thoughts. We're seeking out all ideas. The very best way would be to take the time to write them out in a well-thought-out manner and send them to us by email is the best. We will consider all of those. By doing that, we're also able to go through them and say, these are the parts that are good. These are the parts that might be brilliant. These are parts that are challenging for the following reasons and give good constructive responses to those. Now, I know some people have done those sorts of things or choose to post all kinds of information on social media and that sort of thing. You just need to understand a few things. First of all, a number of us on the board choose to not even have a Facebook account. And we also know that um, a lot of times these may be well intended, but other times they are simply not well intended and, and want to you know, put out false information for rabble rousing or whatever. And it's just, I just don't see that as being a very constructive way to, to get to real answers on this. Um, we just don't have an interest in having, having Facebook wars. Um, I mean, we had, I saw one post somebody showed to me is actually from a person who's a candidate for the board who posted that we could easily solve this problem for $80,000 by moving some gravel, but instead we've chosen to spend $500,000 on a study. Now, you know, you can do this kind of stuff if you want and people might get riled up, but then they come to us and we have to try to answer those and it's, it's just not constructive. Now, after the presentation today, after you've seen all the facts, we want to hear from anyone and everyone who has constructive thoughts. And um, I, as far as I'm concerned, I'll stay here all day and all night to hear any kind of constructive things. But just to point out a few things, if you, if you mainly want to tell us how disappointed you are that Nine Holes of Burksdale is closed, I can tell you we are in 100% agreement with you. We have fully heard that and we are in 100% agreement. I can tell you there, I am as enthusiastic and avid a golfer as there is in Bella Vista or, or any place. And I am as frustrated by that as anybody. If you want to tell us how important golf is to our community, if you want to tell us how important these golf courses are to you personally, we have absolutely fully heard that 100% and we are in agreement with you 100% about that. If you want to tell us that you disagree with these findings or that you know more than the experts and that they are wrong for some reason, you are free to do that. But frankly, you're going to be wasting everybody's time. I can't tell you how many times people have come up to all of us on the board and, and, and want to confront us with all of these thoughts and all of these emotions, sometimes in quite an unfriendly manner, I, I have to say. But, and then we have to hear how so-and-so is continuing to badmouth us to anybody and everybody who will listen. It's not very constructive, but I, and some of us, I think, sometimes may think this is not what we signed up for, but it's a problem and we're going to go about it in a, in a logical way. Um, I hope we don't need to have, you know, sometimes I, I have to say I feel, you know, a little bit like um, the guy who was going to take the kids to the zoo, and on the day we're going to go to the zoo, there's a giant storm and flood and the zoo is closed, but still I'm the bad guy, and, he, you know, uh, and they want to complain to their friends and throw a fit because I won't let them, you know, go to the zoo. And I, and I think all of us on the board think, well, you either have a very high opinion of us that you think we can control the weather, <laughs> or you have a very low opinion of us that you think we're going to use some excuse to randomly take something away from what we all want to have or be angry at us today for being the messengers to tell, of telling you the facts that we do know about this now. So 
I hope we don't, we, we've always said we have a three minute limit on these things. I don't like to do that if somebody has something constructive, but if, if we do want to have everybody have a chance to talk if they want to, keeping in mind again, we are only talking today about facts and we're not, as far as decision making, there's going to be other opportunities for that. I can tell you it's not going to be solved overnight. And I can tell you one other thing you can do that um, is important. We have another board election coming up. Ask these people, talk to them, get their thoughts and ideas. What are your plans? To ask yourself who is most likely to find the best possible solution for all of us. I mean, to me, it's critical that David Welchel be on this board again and continue all the work. And the, you know, there are not very many people like him in the world, and he happens to live right here. Patrick Laurie, who is right here, has been with us for the last three years and is running again. He's been very involved in all of the things that you've seen we've been trying to do to enhance our community, to fix things up, to, to rejuvenate and make Bella Vista as great as possible for everybody. And this is the biggest rejuvenation challenge we've ever faced. I mean, here's what I know. We have a beautiful valley of more than 200 acres going right through Bella Vista with a beautiful free flowing stream. And I believe we can find a solution that's going to allow us both to keep this beautiful valley very beautiful, very attractive, very useful for all of us, and assure that we have attractive, open, uh, fun to play golf courses that we'll all enjoy in Bella Vista. I don't know how we're going to accomplish that yet, but we're going to start, we're going to take it step by step, not have a preconceived idea and then only try to get information that supports what we've already decided. We take it step by step as I, as I explained. And today we're going to start just by reviewing the facts that we know right now. So with that, we'll turn it, turn it over to Tom and at the end we can have everybody's uh, comments. Thanks. Anybody remember what Joe Friday's saying was from Dragnet? Just the facts, ma'am. So that's what we're going to focus on in this presentation. We're going to go over the facts. They may not be what you want to hear, but it's the facts, and that's why we hired the experts. Okay, so please hold your questions to the end. Good chance we will cover um, your questions during the presentation. Also, uh, on Sunday, we sent out an email and posted it on Facebook about uh, the web page. Uh, this entire presentation is now on that web page. So if you want to go on your mobile device, you can probably jump ahead and see what I'm going to cover in a few minutes. Here's the agenda. Here are the items we're going to cover. And Ron went, went over some of these items already. But uh, this is what we're going to be covering. But I think what's important on the right-hand side is what we will not cover at this meeting. And Ron already talked about this. Okay. All right. Let's talk about a site overview. I want to make sure over the last eight, nine months, we've been poring over maps, and so it's, it becomes very familiar to look at a map and know where everything is, but I want to make sure everybody here understands it also. So here is a satellite view. You'll see that Lake Bella Vista is towards the bottom. We have Branchwood, uh, I'm sorry, Burksdale, Kingswood, and all the way to the north, you have the state line. Uh, often I'll use uh, Lake Windsor as kind of my marker. I'll start at Wh Lake Windsor and then I'll determine where I'm at from there. Okay, quick facts. All three golf courses are located in a floodplain. That's a fact. These co courses were intentionally placed in a floodplain because homes could not be built. Cooper couldn't build homes in a floodplain, so that's why they put the golf courses there. As development has increased upstream, the flooding of Little Sugar Creek has increased. I don't think that's, I'm telling you anything you don't already know. There is no way to stop the flooding. Our goal is to minimize it, okay? Minimize the impact. Okay, here is a satellite image. It's a little grainy because it goes back to 97. But this is a satellite image and everything that is highlighted is the watershed, okay? Huge watershed. This is the same area 20 years later. You have 85.8 square miles of watershed that flow into Lake Bella Vista. And if you look towards the bottom, 
you can see all the, uh, all the development, all this development. You can see here, and if you skip back, you look in that same area, you can't hardly see anything. So those are all rooftops, parking lots, streets, driveways, everything that does not absorb water. We went online, we tried to do some searching. This is 99 compared to 2006. I wish they had something more updated than this, but they don't. But in this seven year period, you can see that in 99, the, the amount of pasture land in the watershed, the Little Creek watershed has gone from 31% down to 22%. The amount of forest has gone down from 57 to 53 and the urbanization has gone from 10% to 19%. If, you were, if we had the information and we can't, couldn't find it online, I don't think it's available, if you were to fast forward 11 more years, I have a feeling that all those numbers would be considerably smaller when it comes to pasture land, forest land, but the urbanization would probably be off the charts. Okay, now why did I cover all those? Why did I talk about the expansion? Okay, that's where all the water's coming from. That's all where all the water's coming from. We looked at studies, and it looked at the amount of uh, water that is absorbed by an open field compared to a parking lot, and it is tremendous. It is very different. Here's the inundation maps. Okay, first of all, cross-sections, otherwise known as surveying. Okay, we want to make sure that we go through and we have precise measurements on these different areas. And when we originally sat down and we're going over how many cross-sections we had, we felt that we should have at least 10. Well, the, engineer, the hydrologist came back and said, no, we're going to do a lot more than 10. We did, they did 193. So that means that the, uh, the inundation map is very accurate and it is FEMA compliant. Okay, now all the, uh, what you see on the overhead is also printed over here. If you want to, this will be up after the meeting. If you want to come down and take a look at it, uh, feel free to do so. Uh, but you can see here's Burksdale and you can see on the top area, you can see the 10 year flood, the 50 and the 100, and you can see it's quite extensive when you start looking at the 100-year map, 100-year flood. Here's Kingswood, and then the Country Club. And I think these are maps that are better that you research them either up front or do them at your own home because they're so detailed. But it shows you how much flow is potential to come through. All right, let's talk a little history. Ron referenced uh, uh, the total cleanup costs over time. And you'll see in 08, that was $90,000. In 2011, it was 400. In 13, we had 1.3, 550 of that was the repurposing of branch wood. 15 was 173. 17 was 134. These numbers do not include, this is cleanup and repair. This does not include loss of revenue. Okay, And the 2017 number, we really just scratched the surface. Okay, So the 2017 number is going to be quite a bit higher. But that's $2.1 million in the last 10 years just on flooding. Okay. On the reports that are available online, one of the reports focuses in on bridge damage and replacement costs. Okay, So we, we call them the flat bridges. These are bridges that have piers inside the stream. Okay, Those piers stop debris, they cause problems, 
and we have five of them. What we would, the best thing to do would have arch bridges that stay away from the stream bed uh, and, go, and fly over from one bank to the other. The recommendation is that we replace all five of these bridges in the next five years because at some point we're going to lose them. We've already lost one and we're going to lose more as it goes along. We could, if we did them all at one time, there could be a savings, but that's a heck of an expense. So here's, uh, this is the February flood. Okay, we just had it a couple of weeks ago. Was not a 100-year flood, was not a 25 or a 10-year flood. It was just a normal annual flood. And that little sliver is what you see of one of the bridges at Burksdale. So, bridge replacement. Here's Casey's right here. You'll see that this is site one, site two, site three, and site four. And the dollar amounts. We got with uh, the, the uh, fire chief for Bella Vista because some of these bridges need to ha be able to carry more of a load than other ones because of uh, because emergency purposes and accessibility. And so all these bridges conform to accessibility needs and our own equipment needs, okay? There's one on Kingswood. It's across from the recycling center. That's 425,000, so total bridge replacement is $2 million, quite a bit of money. Stream banks damage assessment. Uh, there are multiple sites along the creek. Multiple locations that we uh, will require design work and permitting. And the, the design work and the permitting is a significant portion of the total expense. It is not this easy thing to do. It takes a lot of time. This option includes riprap. I'm going to talk about riprap. We're going to get into a terms section in just a few moments because I want to make sure everybody's on the same page as to what we're talking about. But riprap is large stones and in this case over 90 pounds. So here are the different uh, locations. You can see Casey's is to the boards the bottom and here is site one and two. This is right next to the bridge. Site three over here, right next to uh, the green up here. I'm not going to use the green numbers because we've changed the green numbers at Burksdale so many times I can't even tell you what number they are. So you see that you have 77,000 for site one, 95,000 site two, 182,000, and then 269,000. We have additional sites more north, you can see this location, this location, and this location. So you're talking 1.16 million to repair. Now this is using the riprap rip rip method. There is another method, methodology that we're going to talk about in a few moments, okay? Because there's different ways to solve your problem. Some of them are more effective, usually the ones that are more effective or more costly, and there's ones that are less effective. You'll notice that the majority of the instances, the damage is caused, of course, I'm, I'm stating the obvious, where the turn, where the bend in the stream is. You're trying to take all this water and shove it to the right or shove it to the left, and it doesn't want to do that. It wants to go straight. Okay, so what were our goals? Okay, so. I wanted to give you the inundation maps. I wanted to give you the site overview. I wanted to kind of just lay the groundwork. And then what were the goals of the committee? What are we trying to accomplish? Well, first of all, stabilize stream bank erosion. Next thing, when we first spoke with Burns McDonald, we said, well, we want to make sure that we get it to a point where we have zero damage after a flood. 
Ryan was Ryan from Burns McDonald was very polite and didn't laugh at us. But inside he was, because he was, he was saying, you can't do that. Okay, so we picked $200,000. We felt that $200,000 worth of damage was a reasonable amount that we could absorb in our budget. Okay, so can you argue that it should have been 100000 Can you argue that it should have been 500000 Absolutely. We picked 200000 It seemed convenient. Okay, because you can't bring it down to zero. It's impossible. Uh, so we selected the goal, uh, but we also have to acknowledge that when we have the larger floods, the 200000 goes out the window very quickly, okay? Because there's, there's just no way to do it, okay? So we asked Ryan to give us a guarantee on that 200000 and for some odd reason, he wouldn't give us that guarantee. Okay, so fact on the bottom. We talked about what's the facts, just the facts, ma'am. All right. There is nothing we can do to stop the flooding. Our goal is to minimize the damage caused by the flooding. And you'll notice that I have the same statement or a similar statement throughout this presentation. Okay, And I've done this on purpose because this is a fact that not everybody wants to hear. But it is a fact just the same. Okay, definitions. The first one. I don't know who came up with this name, but it's a tongue twister. Longitudinal peaked stone toe protection, riprap, and gabion walls. Okay, so the first one is longitudinal stone, the first one. Um, all right, so a Woodrow, I had to look that word up, I didn't know what it meant or line of rock at the toe or bottom of a slope, willows are typically planted behind the rock to provide ruggedness. Uh, places rocks where it is needed rather than over an entire slope. So typically on riprap, you put the stone over the entire slope where this places it just where you need it. It is, recap, it is a good quality solution that is also cost effective. So here is a diagram. I didn't draw it. Um, and you'll see that here is the stonework and it's at the toe. It's not going all the way up the bank like you see with riprap. It's just at the toe and then they use vegetation to control it. Okay. Uh, the diagram, this diagram is from the internet. Okay, here is an exam, here is a picture of them putting it in. Uh, not here, it's at some other location, but you'll see that it's just along the toe. And then they come back in and they add wood and they add foliage and so forth. Okay. And a little bit later on, if you have any specific questions about that, Ryan can answer those questions. Okay, so that's one method. The second method is riprap. Okay, and we've seen rip. You can go out on our golf courses right now. You can see different locations where riprap has actually worked. But here's the one thing that we learned very quickly in going through this entire process is while it works where it is located, in many instances, what it does is it causes damage further downstream or it increases the pace of the water, which causes more damage downstream. Okay, so riprap will stabilize the stream banks, has already proven to be successful in other locations, similar in many respects to the longitudinal, yet more expensive. And we have a lot of stream bank. We don't have a little bit. We have a whole bunch. We have three golf courses worth of stream bank. Here's an example of riprap. As I've indicated on the golf course, uh, on our golf courses, you can see some examples. Last one, and the most effective, but the one that's highly expensive, is gabion walls. Okay? This is basically a box of rocks. It's a wire box with rocks in it.
okay? Um, Gabion walls offer a tremendous amount of protection, but they are very expensive. And we actually have some. We have a couple locations the, on our golf courses where we have Gabion walls. This is by number 18, one of the 18s that we have. Um, and this is not here. This is just an example. Uh, you can even see a train track on the left-hand side, so you can know that it's not here. But that's a Gabion wall. And here's uh, another example. Okay, so a possible solution that was gone, that went through, or that was presented in the study. Total length of the channel is 7,000 linear feet. Okay, over all three of the golf courses. After a thorough assessment of that entire 7,000 feet, we determined that approximately 6,500 of it, we could use the longitudinal method. About 500 of it, we'd have to use the Gabion wall method. And I think that you guys can probably even figure out which of the areas, you know, the one by that and by the bridge, that's a pretty bad area. Chances are that would be an area that they would use the Gabion wall method because it goes up very steeply. Okay. Estimated project cost is 1.7, but it includes, that number includes a very high contingency uh, because there's a, still a lot of unknowns. Okay. Remember, we'd have to have, we have to have an engineer go in, do a full analysis of each location. We got to do permitting and so forth. So that's why we have a very conservative high number. Okay. Last one is how long is this going to take? Okay. This is important because some people think this is an easy fix. It's not an easy fix. This is actually when you get done, when you're talking about all the engineering you have to do, the permitting, the construction, you're looking from 18 to 24 months from the moment that the board says go, you're looking at a year and a half to two years before the work is done. So this is not an easy process. This is not a quick and easy fix. So. Stream bank stabilization, 1.7. Bridge repair, $2 million, three point, you know, almost 3.8. What does this not include? A lot of additional costs, okay? We still need to do a lot more repair. We're going to have to raise some greens. We're going to have to, okay? We're going to have to fix some, some areas. We're going to have to raise tees. We're going to have to raise some greens in selected areas that we know that we have problems. And you're probably talking, when you look at all this work, you're talk, probably talking in the millions, okay? But we haven't gotten to that point. Remember, we're talking about facts. We're not talking about conjecture. That's what today's meeting is facts, not conjecture. So if I went through and I said, Keith, get me all those numbers, that's conjecture. And if I put it up there, that's conjecture. We're talking about facts today. But the reality is we know that number is going to be a big number. Okay? So you're probably, total project, you're probably talking about $5 million plus. That's me shooting from the hip, but I'm feeling pretty good about that guess. All right. So, through this entire process, we've looked at a bunch of different solutions. And we wanted to make sure, let me back up. Why am I making this presentation? Okay. Sure, I'm in charge. We'd get together, when we first met with Ryan, and it was Jim, who's been around here forever and knows so much about this valley. And, and David is an, a golf course architect. And Keith knows everything about golf course maintenance. And Mike is just Mr. Wonderful. Uh, where do I fit in? I'm, I, so I made the comment one of those first meetings, I'm the least qualified here. OK? 
okay? Because I don't know as much as they do. But the reality is, is when we sat down with Ryan, I wanted to make sure that the, that the report, the executive summary, was written in such a way where I would understand it, okay? I wanted every person to be able to understand what we were working on, okay? And the conclusions that we came to. Because too many, who, who, who here have seen those different expert analysis reports and you read them and you have no idea what they say, okay? I didn't want that to happen this time, okay? So that's why I'm presenting. Sure, I'm in charge, but I wanted to make sure that this presentation and the report was understandable to everybody, okay? Now, a lot of people came to us with different ideas. We saw different ideas in the newspaper. Um, some of them were in more or less interesting, but we wanted to make sure that everybody understood. We listened and we talked to the, the hydrologist and we looked at these different things to make sure that we considered them. Okay. Feedback's important. Listening is important. All right, so possible solutions that we investigated and we determined that were impractical or unrealistic. All right. Use Lake Bella Vista for storm water detention to keep the golf courses from flooding. We've heard, I've heard this a lot. This is the most often, this is why I have it listed first. The single most frequent, oh, that's great English, uh, the fr most frequent one that comes up. All right, so here's the uh, problem. Lake Bella Vista, in any way, shape, or form, however, whatever uh, uh, Bentonville decides to do with it, whether they turn it into a, ha replace the dam, they remove the dam, they do a common, whatever, it's insignificant. You have 85.8 square miles of tributary flow into a lake with 27 acres of surface area with a dam height of 16 feet, otherwise known as a puddle. It's nothing. It's insignificant. So, Ryan, in his report, gave you a comparison. So here's Lake Bella Vista on the left, and you have Lake Fort Smith on the right. We have more, a larger tributary, 85.8 square miles. Dam height on Lake Bella Vista is 16. Dam height on Lake Fort Smith is 200. Uh, storage volume, 57 acre feet compared to 84,000 acre feet. 27 acres surface area, 1,400 acres of surface area. Now, disclaimer, Lake Fort Smith, it's, it's not designed to do, you know, it's not a perfect point of comparison. Sure, you can throw stones at the comparison, fine. But the point is, is that other dam is huge and Lake Bella Vista is a puddle. It was never designed to do that. All right, so we went to Ryan and we said, okay, what if we enlarged Lake Bella Vista? Now, this is kind of a throwing yourself out there because we don't own it. So it's not like we can do this. But let's say we were able to talk Bentonville into doing this. All right, so let's dig it out. Let's, you know, because way, and way back when, they dug it, dug it out every year. Okay, so we went and said, we're going to dig this thing out to an extreme. And guess what you still get? A puddle. You still wind up with a puddle. It's, you, you, you got a bigger puddle, but it's, not, it's still a puddle. So that's what all those lines along there are. We, and look at... Look at how much larger this area. I mean, here's the water right here. Here's the truth. You know, so we looked at really expanding it. Nah, still a puddle. But we looked at it. We analyzed it. We got the facts. We didn't just write it off. We heard what the property owners had to say, and we looked at it. And there's like force. Huge. Huge. 
Oh, this is my favorite one. Raise the level of the dam at Lake Bella Vista. Okay, so if you recall, in 2017, um, it was all, the, the, the water was almost getting on to 71. Do you think the government's going to let us flood 71? I don't think so. Um, what about the businesses downstream? If you raise it up, the water's got to go somewhere. It's, it's got to go somewhere. It's a huge amount of water. It's got to go somewhere. So raising the level of the dam, unless you're going to raise it to the sky, it's just not going to work. Okay, use the POA lakes for stormwater detention. Okay, so we're going to lower all, we're going to make, you know, one of the ideas, and, and, and early on this seemed, okay, well, what if we lowered all the lakes a foot? Okay, you know, it, it would be a little bit of an inconvenience. Could, could we do that? Would it work? I mean, so early on, it seemed like a reasonable endeavor to go, go into. And I think there was even an article in the newspaper on this one. So here's the big, here's two, a couple things. First of all, the lakes were designed for recreational purposes. So they were designed for fishing, for water skiing, for boating. They weren't designed for detention, retention. That was not why they were built. Okay. Second of all, and this is the kicker, the lakes feed into Little Sugar Creek downstream of where the majority of the damage is. Downstream. So you can save all the water, but it's not going to help us out one bit. Even if you enlarged Lake Bella Vista and kept all of the POA lakes dry, brought them all the way down to zero, it still doesn't give you enough retention, detention capacity to solve the problem because there's a huge amount of water. Okay, but we looked at it. We looked at it. I mean, I'm sure the homeowners that live on these lakes really th were thrilled that we looked at the that idea. But we looked at it. Um, the biggest lake, Loch Lomond, feeds into Gordon Hollow watershed, so it's not even fa a factor in here. So the largest lake that can potentially contribute the most amount of retention and detention is not a player because it does not feed into Little Sugar Creek. It does, I think Ryan would correct me and say, it feeds into it in, somewhere in Missouri and we don't care. All right, so there's all the lakes. Um, here is the flow of water. Uh, so the flow of water goes this way. And if you recall from one of the earlier slides, a lot of the damage was here. Uh, is it right about there? Okay, and here are the lakes, so they flow in right around there. So they feed into Little Sugar downstream. Okay, so that's not a viable solution. But we looked at it. Once again, we looked at it. Oh, this is my favorite one. Sue Bentonville. Okay, Sue Benefil. Wow, I love. So, we looked at it. We looked at it. Okay, so first of all, when you build a golf course, if you build anything in a flood zone and it has been de declared as a flood zone for a really long time, when they put the golf courses in there, they knew it was a flood zone. Why? Because they didn't put any homes there. And we know that Cooper would have put homes every single place they can possibly sell a home. But they can't sell homes there because it's in the flood zone. So they put a golf course. It's a great place for a golf course. All right? So when you put something in a flood zone, you there is an assumed risk, of course. Advice of the legal counsel, blah, blah, blah. The only people that get rich are the lawyers. Sorry, I'm a little plucky. Um, remove the gravel in the creek and dig down to increase the capacity of the creek. Similar to the dam, similar to Lake, uh, the POA Lake scenario, removal of the gravel would not provide a meaningful impact. We even looked at all three. We looked at increasing the size of Lake Bella Vista, 
drying out all the recreational lakes and removing all the gravel. Still nothing. You, it's just too much flow. Other ideas, construct, construction of concrete gates along Little Sugar to keep the water confined to the creek, it just is not practical. Uh, install large French drains to move water into the aquifer, no, it, it's not going to work. All right, earlier, Ron talked about we want your feedback. We'd like you to take a deep breath. We'd like you to make it as concise as possible, because I've got to read every single one of them. Um, but send us your feedback. So this is an email address. And this email actually goes straight to me. Okay, So it is floodstudy at bvvpoa.com. Send us your thoughts. Send us your ideas, constructive we're going to read it. All right, next step. So, well, first of all, let's back up. The meeting on Thursday at 4 o'clock is identical to this one. If you want to come again, great. Um, but it's, it, it, we're not covering any additional uh, material. The questions may be different but we're not going to cover any additional information. So there's no difference between today's meeting and uh, Thursday's meeting. Um, next. Uh, so April 10th at 4 o'clock here again, we're going to talk about possible solutions. Okay, Talk about options, possibilities. Um, so today's meeting, we talked about the facts. Uh, no decision has been made by the board regarding the future of the golf courses in the valley. Let me repeat that. No decision has been made. Don't believe what you read on Facebook. Finally, uh, the flood study and this uh, today's presentation is available on our website at valley-flood-study. Okay. We've given you everything. We've given you all the minutes of all the meetings. Uh, we've given you all the studies, the executive studies, the presentation. We've tried to give you as much as possible so that you can be as informed as we are. Okay, we'd like you, if possible, to limit your comments to, to three minutes. Can't guarantee you we're going to ask you every single answer every single question, but we'll listen to you. Um, I will make one comment. Ryan is our guest, and he should be treated accordingly. Um, but uh, yes, Ron? Maybe we should ask the members of the Valley Task Force to come back up front here, and any other members of the board who would like to come up front. Uh, I know we have a microphone we can hand down. So in any kind, if there are specific questions that we can answer in a reasonably short time, we'll do that. Uh, others, we might just make notes. I've got a notepad and, and say we'll be getting back to you. Um, again, we want to be able to hear from everybody. I, I would hate to have to use the three-minute timer, but uh, if we stay focused, I think we'll find, and we want to make sure everybody has, a, has an opportunity. Uh, just step up to the microphone at the front there. There we go. Uh, one correction, I, I, when I sat down next to Ryan, I asked him if I messed up at all. He said only on one thing. Um, the stream length is 6.5 miles. The 7,000 that was quoted earlier, that's the area, that's the length that needs to be repaired, not the entire length of the stream. Okay, that's a correction. Is that one on? My name is Randy Wyatt.
I have that way on electronics, you know. Uh, my name is Randy Wyatt. I've been a resident here since 2007, and I've been through several of the floods as well. Um, but my question is, when you were talking about the drawdown of the lakes, you said, well, the lakes drawdown wouldn't help because it's further downstream, kind of in the Kingswood area and country club area. Then part of the other's, other's presentation, as I understood it, is a lot of the problem is upstream, through Birchdale, all the water gets moving really fast, and that causes the damage. Well, why wouldn't less water coming at one end give, uh, give less damage to the water coming upstream if you had less water downstream? I mean, I mean, it's fluid dynamics, right? So if you got less water coming in, it won't, the water upstream can move slower because it's not pushing as hard against uh, the downstream. So to me, lake drawdowns of the lakes that feed into Kingswood and Country Club, uh, 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 Little Sugar, uh, it seems to me that that would help ameliorate the problem somewhat. So the answer to that question uh, is the majority of the damage occurred upstream where there's a little less water than downstream where the lakes converge and start feeding in. So the majority of the damage is where there is less water. But you're still talking an order of magnitude. There is just so much water coming down, it, it, it provides an insignificant... Well, to me, it seems like if there's less water, significantly less water downstream, the water upstream isn't going to be as dynamic and as raised as high as, fa as fast and oh, okay, okay. would do less okay, damage. So hold on. So the lakes are higher than the stream. So the, we're not, the stream does not feed into the lakes, the recreational lakes. The recreational lakes feed into the stream. Exactly. Okay. So, but still... When they release, because they all have spillways, when they release, it's downstream of where the majority of the damage is. So it does not contribute at all. Well, just as an example, during the last flood we had, uh, Scottsdale always seems to get beat up pretty good uh, in certain areas in Scottsdale. You had the, you had the drawdown from, uh, from uh, Loch Lomond at the time we had the flood, and Scottsdale was almost was not impacted at all last time. So to me, I think the, the drawdown of Scottsdale had something to do with that, personally. Well, that was a, first of all, to clarify, uh, Loch Lomond feeds into the I mean, Gordon Loch Hollow. Lomond, I'm sorry, Loch Lomond. Loch Lomond, Lomond yes, feeds Loch into the Lomond. Gordon Hollow watershed, right. which, does, which does feed into Little Sugar, but in Missouri, okay? Uh, but doesn't impact us at all. But you had a four foot drawdown but you're still talking that storm was minor in comparison to what we're talking about. But, the, but Kingswood and the other courses did flood. And back when that happened in previous times, Scottsdale also, several of the holes at Scottsdale would flood. Uh, this time, nothing happened yeah. at Scottsdale pretty much. Okay, so here was one of the other questions that came up, and, and I didn't include this, but... One of the ideas was, okay, you lower the lakes, the recreational lakes, in anticipation of a flood. Sound reasonable? Or the problem is, is how do you estimate, how do you predict when these significant events are gonna occur? Um, it, we can lower most of the lakes about three inches a day, correct? three inches a day. So that means we need at least a week's notice to lower a lake. So a week out, we'd have to go, oh my God, the 100-year flood is coming one week from today, so we're going to start lowering the lake right now. And then what would happen is maybe that, that storm misses us. So we're raising and lower and raising and lower. It's not a practical solution. Seems uh, better than spending $5 million. It's not a practical solution. Okay. Well, I just had one more question, but I'll get it to somebody else. Thanks.
morning. My name is Dick Hartman. Good morning. My name is Dick Hartman. I live at 3 Milford Lane. Uh, I have some questions regarding the, uh, the cost numbers on the survey. Um, on each occurrence, uh, the five bridges and the seven river banks, each one denotes a permit required of $7,000. So if you repair all the river banks in one, can't you do that in one permit? Do you need a permit for each rock that you're going to move, or, or how does that work? Our assumption was that one would be repaired at a time. And so you'd have to go through that permitting process. If you were to so, combine all of them into one, there would be a cost savings. Because so the instead, permitting, construction, mobilization would all be decreased. So you'd get, a, get it all done with one $7,000 permit, if you did it all at once. You or could reduce, yes. Yeah. OK. Uh, on the riverbank repair, there is also an item that uh, says roadway design. What is that when you're fixing a riverbank? It comes to a total of $157,000 for the seven riverbank repair sites. We're not redesigning the highway. We're fixing a riverbank. That roadway design was just, it's a uh we could rename it something else, but it's just setting up the construction documents. So it's, you don't know what it is? It's setting up the, the construction documents for doing that permitting. It's just, you could call it stream, we call it roadway design, you could call it stabilization design. It was just a, a name holder. Okay. It's not, it's not roadway design, it's setting up the construction documents, the plans, the permits, it's kind of all that grouped. The permits are listed Well, the permits separately. are different, but it's the construction uh, documents. The study, EPA study is listed separately. Uh, the geo investigations listed separately. Bidding phase, that would be hiring somebody to haul the rocks, right? Uh, construction administration, $25,000 per site. I don't know what kind of toner you use in your copy machine, but that seems a little high to me. I don't want to be, you know, disrespectful, but these numbers really look inflated to me, and I don't know what purpose uh, you're trying to fulfill here by doing this, but... Uh, these, these numbers are from a company that we have used. They are valid. We did not inflate them. They are valid. It is expensive to do work in the stream bank. Costs go up. Is it expensive to do this work? We are not in any way fluffing the numbers to push one agenda or the other. These are facts. But there are several areas that we could get rid of some of these costs by combining or, or completing more work in one. A absolutely. One in one of the slides that I had listed, if we do all five of the bridges all at the same time, we would have a, a certain amount of savings. Okay, right now we have a relatively new administration in Washington that is, uh, I understand they've already started uh, procedures to reduce the EPA overreach, and we don't know what's going to happen eventually, but for us to make a decision to get rid of a valuable golf course at this point in time without knowing what's going to happen uh, as far as our interaction with a stream I think would be premature. Today we're talking about facts. We're not talking about what the uh, going forward strategy is. Okay, so if you make a decision to get rid of a golf course, that's a fact that you've lost it. A year from now, you could maybe go in that stream bed, harvest a bunch of gravel, build some levees that would divert the water somewhat. And also another measure that we could do is clean up the areas along the river banks. Let, for example, uh, hole number two at the country club, the, the old hole, which would be 11 now, 
if you look along to your left as you're going down that fairway, in that tree line is debris that's very, you know, accumulated over the years. Couldn't we go in there and clean that debris out of there because that's what really causes the damage when we have a flood. This floating debris gets trapped and creates a dam, which creates a churning action that scours the, the golf course. I think we could, we could spend uh, our labor hours with our maintenance crew in the wintertime cleaning some of that stuff up. All you gotta do is pile it up and light it on fire. Dick, you know, I, I know you have a lot of interest in this. Here's what I suggest. Write these specific thoughts and ideas out and send them to us at, the, at, at that, and we will consider all of them. Today, I think we want to have give everybody a chance. We've got a line behind okay, you to I make comments, and, and everything you send to us will be considered and okay, responded. Okay, thank you. Thank Thanks. you for your time. Good morning. My name is Z.C. Wilson. I want to thank everybody up here on this board for doing the job that you've done. My, my question is this, and this is the way I think we should proceed in some way. We know what the costs are. We're not, those costs are not going to change dramatically over the next three, four, or five years. If anything, they'll go up. They will not go down. My question is this to the board, and I think this is what you should do. Determine how much you can afford to do for the next five years. Have a five-year plan. Adjust those numbers and see what you can do. And my question is, for example... If you're going to replace five bridges, maybe you can only do two this year. If, if you can only build the, uh, the rocks up, only do a certain amount. My question then is, if we, for example, build on the sides of the creek, the big rocks, what do they call that, riffraff or whatever it was, if the next flood, would the next flood actually cause damage more because that's been done, and would it affect the next project we wanted to do? So you need to plan, I think, at least a five-year program, minimum a five-year program, and take each one of these situations and say, if we do this, how is it going to affect this? Is it going to damage this further downstream if we do this here? And then budget. You all have run budgets. I've run multi-million dollar budgets. I would do a five-year plan. This is the way we're going to do it. This is how we're going to do it. And the only way this would work is if we know what one effect would be to the other. And I've been here, what, 12 years, and I can say this about that creek. I remember going across from one to two on the country club. There used to be a big swimming hole there. It used to be about 10, 15, 15 feet deep. Now it's six inches deep. So trying to dredge a creek, even if we could get the Board of Engineers, the Corps of Engineers to allow it, is ridiculous because every time you have a flood, the creek changes. That's a fact. The way is to keep it inside those banks as much as physically possible to minimize the damage. If we have a 10-year flood, we don't have to have a half a million dollars damage. Maybe we can have a much smaller amount, but not zero, of course. We know that. Thanks, guys. I appreciate it much. Hi, my name is uh, Steve Munch. I've been a resident here for her since 2009. Close to the microphone, speak up. All right. Oops. I've got other stuff. For me. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, my name is Steve Munch, and I've been a resident here for uh, since 2009. So I'm relatively new. But. <laughs> I'm relatively new here. Uh, all right. Um, I looked at the report last night, uh, so I was up late last night reading all the reports. Uh, it's very well constructed, I think. Uh, it was a very good report. Um, i got to commend people that did prepare it and your efforts preparing it. Uh, what I did notice, though, is what... Basically, it says is that uh, Lake Bella Vista uh, and that watershed cannot be controlled. So that amounts to, I calculated it based on the tributary areas here in acreages, but that's 78% of the flow um, in a 
storm. And what we control, Bella Vista, is the five lakes that affect, um, it affects um, Country Club and um, um, Kingswood, right? So with that, we control 22% of that storm, storm surge by the lakes, where we can. That's a fair, I think that's a fairly significant amount. So we don't back the water up like Randy says. Uh, in, and the, the surge goes over the boundaries of what we um, currently have for the banks. And the thing is, that we know most of the time there's advance warning of a storm. And so we have some time to prepare for that storm. So if we could drain those lakes down, not one foot, but a significant amount to handle the watershed so that no flow comes over, we got 22% of the water that we can control. Now, and I'm not an expert, so I'll let the expert um, talk to that point. The 22% the is uh, overall acreage. Right. It only contributes, <clears throat> those five dams only contribute 7% of the discharge. And so it's not, it's not a direct ratio control there. Okay. My <laughs> point well taken. Seven percent. Seven percent is better than nothing. <laughs> but also remember, and I, I referenced this just a moment ago, we can only lower the lakes about three inches per day. So to get it down multiple feet would take over a week. Uh, and there's just, you know, how how reliable is the weather is the weatherman in predicting a hundred year flood a week out? It's not. It, it's just not realistic. So what would end okay. up happening is these storms would miss us. We would lower the lake. The storm would miss us, and we'd have the community upset because the lake was lowered and their boat was high and dry. Then we'd raise the lake. It, it's just the, the lakes were not, they were designed, and, and I, that's why it was my first point. They were designed for recreation. They weren't designed for anything other than recreation. Now, if they were designed for detention, they would have designed them differently. All right. That answers my question, I guess. I, I thought I'd bring it up since I calculated it last night, but my calculations, I'm not no. an expert. We appreciate it. Thank <laughs> okay, you. Thank you. Good morning. I'm Buzz Bartley. Uh, 52 years in the steel erection business and steel construction, structural engineer degree from Kansas City, worked on lots of Burns and McDonald's uh, projects, including one of their building uh, additions. And uh, I think there's a potential somewhere between a half a million and $700,000 savings just in the bridge construction project. The uh, only bridge that I see that needs a uh, emergency vehicle uh, access is the one on Kingswood going over to 8, 9, 10, 11, and 12. The other bridges could be built uh, eight foot wide. Uh, we built uh, uh, flood control bridges on three golf courses in Kansas City, Mission Hills, uh, Kansas City Country Club, and Indian Creek. Uh, Indian Creek and, uh, and Brush Creek both uh, flood considerably. So um, one of the considerations in the bridge design was emergency, getting um, ambulances over. but of greater importance is getting Keith's equipment over the bridges. Mm -hmm. So they're designed for both of those purposes. Uh, Keith, how much does uh, one of your larger pieces weigh? So the backhoe we got to get across the, the, all the bridges is 20,000 pounds. Still eight foot wide is going to save you a lot, a lot of money and the only one that uh, would have to be even wide, I don't know that even the Emergency vehicle would only have to be 10 foot wide. So. 
Are they? I'm sorry. All right. Even with their... Most of our mowing equipment, our rough mowers, our fairway mowers, our bigger equipment is needs more than eight feet clearance to get across. Okay. The other, the other savings would be to just uh, design, there's four bridges that look very much similar. Design one uh, at the worst condition and have them all fabricated at once. It's, that's, uh, you could save money. I mean, there's $140,000 per design uh, you could design one for the worst condition, build them all the same. Yeah, in the slide, uh, if you recall, I indicated that if we did all the bridges at the same time, there could be potential savings, um, but it means a bigger price tag that we have to pay. And the gen earlier gentleman was talking about, you know, how, you know, do we want to absorb all the expense in a year's period or we, do we want to spread it out over a five-year period? And we have to look at all those considerations yep. when making the plan. Appreciate the time. Thank you. My name is Tom Richards, and I live at 63 Drogwood Drive here in Bella Vista. And uh, on December 28th, I asked when the H&A study would be released to the members for review after it was announced at the December POA meeting. I was told that the report would be released at these March meetings and not before. However, after reconsideration and a board vote, it was decided that these reports, they would be released 48 hours before today's meetings. At the January POA meeting, it was noted that the rationale for not releasing these reports until 48 hours before the March meetings was to avoid rumors. While the board has authority to withhold these reports from the POA membership as long as you want, you don't have the right to do so. It should have been released openly and freely. The members paid for the study. Your responsibility is the POA members and their families. I'll note that the two H and eight reports were first available to the members on Sunday, March 11th, as planned, and are dated February 12th and February 26th. I personally get the impression that the board considers themselves as a savvy political machine rather than a group representing POA members. As a board, if you can't deal with internet conspiracies and, rumor and rumors, and yet your sole intent is to represent the interests of members in this day and age, you probably shouldn't be representing the members. I'm hoping you accomplished all of your intent by not releasing these reports on receipt. I'm also quite sure you have developed more distrust in your actions as the board than any benefit you gained by not promptly releasing these reports. As a result, I'm requesting that the first draft reports from Burns and McDonald to the POA board be released to POA members. Again, you have the authority but not the right to withhold these documents. It should be released because all changes should have been made solely in the best interest of the members and you should be proud of those changes. Thank you. Now recognize when these reports were released to the board, we felt compelled that it was important that we share these with the board first so that they could digest them and understand them because we knew that if we, once it's re released to the public that they're going to immediately come to the board and ask questions and if the board has not been educated on it. So uh, Ryan met with the board and educated the board so to get them up to speed. Uh, we felt that uh, uh, we released them within a reasonable amount of time. Um, originally, the original idea was not to release them at all until this meeting, uh, but uh, um, a property owner uh, made the suggestion that we release it in advance, and we complied, uh, hence the email that went out on Sunday morning. Uh, and if you go to that web page, there's a lot of information there. There is a lot of time and effort put into all the information that is available. Um, maybe as not, not as quickly as you wanted, but it's there. Uh, but most of all, I, I we wanted to make sure that the board was informed uh, because while a few board members were on this committee along the way and have been educated along the way, many of the board members were not, and we felt that it was important that we educate them uh, because we knew that there was going to be a lot of questions and so forth. So uh, my name is Rex Butler. I've been here about five years. Uh, is all the input data, all the topographic maps and, and 
watershed and all that stuff. Is that on the web now? You mean all the the this these maps? No, I mean the the base topographic map, map that, that maps the watershed and predicts how much water is coming down. Because you're presenting all that as facts, and it's very interpretive. Yeah. 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 Are you talking about the raw data behind? How yeah, these the things? raw data behind. Oh, okay, okay. March 23rd, we'll have that report from Burns McDonald, and we will be posting that on our website. Hello. <laughs> I um, I just wanted to say I am. Uh, uh, live in the Little, Little Sugar Creek watershed, and I'm a big fan of this creek. Uh, I've swam in it since I was a little kid and fished in it. And I, sorry, I said I'm uh, I said I am, uh, I've, I've uh, lived in the area a long while, and, and as a youth, I enjoyed swimming and fishing in Little Sugar Creek. And I think most communities would uh, be really fortunate to have a, a resource like this flowing through the heart of the community. I see a lot of value in that, and I often uh, will meet friends and will kayak and, and go float fishing uh, on the creek. I, I'd have some concerns, I think, with seeing a lot of riprap on the stream banks, and I'd have some concerns with longitudinal peaks, uh, stone protection walls coming out and jutting into the center of the creek. And I would, uh, there's a, a project going on just below the Lake Bella Vista Dam right now, which is using a technique called natural channel design. And the idea there is that they'll use natural products to stabilize the stream bank and reduce erosion. And I, I know that since you've looked at quite a bit of um, uh, different things in this uh, study, I would just uh, hope you could maybe look into that a little bit and... Um, give that some consideration uh, as well. Thank you. Anybody else? Sure. What involvement does the Corps of Engineers have to do with the repairs? I mean, I know that they, they control the streams and they control the tributaries and, and uh, they're a hindrance to getting anything done in a, in a uh, reasonable manner, but uh, what, well, what, can, what options do we have to try to speed them up and uh, what things can we do to help clean up and, and uh, Clean, clean things up? So, uh, really good question, and, and Ryan can elaborate a little bit more, but early on in the process, uh, and if you read through the minutes, you'll see that we had a meeting with the uh, Corps of Engineers, and because uh, we were at, we, we wanted to see if we could find uh, someone to pay for all the studies and everything. You, know, you never know. Um, and uh, by partnering the, with the city, it, we thought maybe, you know, because they're not going to do it for a private entity, and we are a private entity, but they could potentially do it for the city. Uh, but the kicker uh, on why we ended up going on our own to hire Burns McDonald is because they said that the earliest that they could start the study would be three to five years. And that was just to start the study, let alone get the results of the study, determine the course of action, and then put that course of action into place, you could be looking at, well, it was up there, 18 to 24 months if we started the construction today, if we, if we gave the green light. But they were talking three to five years. So we just felt that utilizing the Corps of Engineers was not practical, even though I love the idea of getting it funded by the government. Okay, well, then uh, the, the other question is, do we have to get their approval 
we submit the plans and then they say you're good to go knock yourselves out or what would what happens after after we're ready to go to work we would have to submit a permit for them to them to them and the most time consuming one will probably be actually to fema uh, we'll have to get a fema permit that that typically takes the most amount of time then the, and then the la just one simple question a lot of the a lot of the damages are all done at the big curves and turns and things when we when we do the repairs is there any initiatives to kind of smooth those out maybe to to make for a better transition around the corners yeah that's that's going to be rough to uh, redirect nature um, but uh, going back to the earlier statement uh, uh, about the FEMA uh, permit you're looking at three to six months so that kind of you know you look at the Corps of Engineers three to five years uh, the FEMA permit six months uh, the construction two years um, uh, we felt that that was an unrealistic time frame and we wanted to shorten it as as much as reasonably possible thanks okay anybody else looks like one more okay Uh, I'm John Glick, and um, personally, I feel that I don't think you should spend any money on this uh, golf course at all. I, mean, I think the days of the water is, Mother Nature is against you. Now, if you think that the, as the area grows and the houses are being built here, if you think your golf course is going to have more people playing it here, then what you should do is look at finding a place that doesn't flood to build a course if the demand is there. Um, it's, it's really Mother Nature's against you, and I think you all know that. And, uh, I mean, it's going to continue to happen. <laughs> and, um, you know, it's, it's a great place to play golf, but it's, um, I, I, I think that uh, the, the money being spent, um, it's just going to get worse. There's going to be more and more houses being built and concrete. And that's just my opinion. Thanks. Thanks very much. We appreciate that. And um, sounds like you've been sitting in the board meetings. <laughs> I mean, uh, <laughs> what are the answers to this thing? You know, uh, uh, and what are the, where do we go from here? Um, we're, we're working hard on it, and we're going to continue to do that. We're going to listen to everybody. We're sharing all the information that we have. Um, <clears throat> oops. Not wrapping up yet. One more. Go ahead. I'll be very brief. I just want to support that last gentleman's comments, too. I see an opportunity for the POA, instead of asking members for more money, to reinvest uh, from this money pit to world-class golf courses and other amenities within the village. So that's my opinion as well. Okay. Well, I, like I said, the board is going to consider, and by, by the 10th, what we're committed to doing is at least laying out the various options. Not that we are saying we're for one or the other, but try to identify what are the basic options uh, going forward that make sure we have uh, a beautiful valley, always attractive, but that we also have the golf that, uh, that we want and all the other amenities, and what can we afford and all those things. So we'll be seeking a lot more input. We appreciate you coming out today, and uh, Still a lot of work to be done. Thanks very much.